I don't think there's ever been a time in history when biblical prophecy and world events have coincided more than right now. And I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, I, I mean, I've been studying this since I was in grad school in, in 1983, and I, I love this, but the reason why I'm talking about this is not because I love prophecy, though I do, but I think we need to be aware of what's going on. And I think some, some of us in, in, in the church uh, tend to just kind of mosey through life and we're not on the cutting edge, and we're not sharp on what's going on. Uh, so I want to talk to you about two things today, and then I want to talk about what I think we should do. There was an a, a article on the internet that came out a couple years ago. Maybe you've said it or read it. It was Agenda 21, UN Agenda 21, 2030. And then they'd be, it was pretty widespread, so you probably heard it. If you didn't read it, you probably heard it. And it was about how the UN was going to form one world government and a new world order. And they were going to do a central bank with a currency. They were going to do away with all borders. And they were going to have a basic income for everybody, universal income for everybody, vaccines for everybody, and uh, the end of fossil fuels. That was kind of the, the... And it was believed. I mean, people embraced that widely because people believe that there are governments and people in power behind what's going on. You say, well, are you a conspiracy theorist? No, I know there's a conspiracy by the devil. And he is the prince of darkness, and he works in darkness, and he tries to keep the church in darkness. But it's time for us to come to light and realize that what is going on right now, there's never been a day like today. I don't, know, I don't care how old you are, I've talked to my mom who's 93. She's never seen a day like this. Marsha's mom, 90, never seen a day like this. And maybe you're here and you're up there as well. As, can any of you remember a day like this? There's something going on, and I think we need to, to understand what's going on and understand what to do about it. Right now, Russia is on the border of Ukraine, and, I mean, conflicts are going on around the world. Jesus said to be wars and rumors of war. But there's, there's impending conflicts that are going to occur. Uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. But something, you don't put that many thousands of troops on the border without one not going in. I, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Russia is also now um, sending their MiGs over Syria. They basically said, fine, you know, uh, we saw what, what the U.S. did when it backed out of Afghanistan, and it emboldened Putin, and it emboldened Z, Z. And both of them now are giving a test to the West on what's going to happen. And I think part of that with, with, the, uh, with the Russia now aligning with Turkey, I mean, who would have thunk that? Aligning with Turkey, and, and last week, uh, China, Iran, Russia... Had, uh, had naval exercises altogether. You're kind of scratching your head saying, this sounds, <laughs> this sounds like Bible. This sounds like, I mean, who would have, who would have thought that Ezekiel 38, when you've got these, these, this confederacy of nations coming down against Israel, who would have thought that we'd live to see that day? But, but we're living to see that day. There are, by the way, just seeing, there are, there are two more battles at least in the, in, the, in the Bible. And when I'm talking about the end, I'm not talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about the end of an era and a new era going. I, if Jesus were to come today for us and take the rapture of the church, we got at least a thousand seven years more. So understand that. I'm not talking about the end of the world and things blowing up. I'm talking about the end of an age. And that's what we're living in, I think, the end of an age. And at the end of the age, what we're seeing is the travail and birth of a new era that's about to come and about to, about to take place. But we see these conflicts going on. Uh, uh, last week, the Iran-backed Houthis uh, shot drones, missiles into uh, United Arab Emirates. You kind of go, what does that mean? Well, they're from Yemen, and now Saudi Arabia feels threatened, and the Middle East is it's, it's up in the air. 
China is threatening Taiwan. They won't do anything. You, you can be safe until after the Olympics. <laughs> after the Olympics, no promises. But you know, it's very much like uh, when, when uh, Hitler had the Olympics in Berlin in 1936. Nothing happened until after the Olympics. Then, boom, things began to break loose. I think this year we'll begin to see things break loose. And I think the conflicts that we're starting to see right now are going to escalate. And the, the, uh, the other thing, the currencies that are going in. Did you read, did you read about the, the uh, Swedish, his name is Johan uh, Osterland. I'm sure I'm pronounce, mispronouncing that. He's the CEO of Bio, Biohacks International. And uh, because they're requiring vaccines in Sweden, uh, they are now planting a chip, Biohacks, into to every Swedish citizen. It's about the size of a piece of rice. And you can put that in, when you go someplace, just show that. It's acceptable for your vaccine. Now you have that. Or for contactless payments. Have you, have you seen kind of, we went to McDonald's. They said, thank you for your correct change. Or contactless payments. You're kind of going, this is unbelievable. And the, the new mayor of New York City, uh, Eric Adams is his name, and he demanded that his first pay be in uh, Bitcoin. Crypto coin, not Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a type. There are 6,500 now coins. Did you know that? That are going on around the Bitcoin, you know that, and, and Dogecoin and Litecoin and... You say, what, sh what should we do? But China is now doing that. The Federal Reserve is now starting a, a, a central bank uh, crypto, uh, crypto coin. Did you know that? There, you're kind of going, am I, am I the only one reading the Bible? It sounds a lot like one world sounds a lot like Revelation 13 where one guy takes power. And it sounds a lot like you're not able to buy or sell without taking the mark of the beast. Now, let me just say this. We won't be here. I'm not going to, if you're here, welcome. But I'm not going to be here with the mark of the beast. When that comes, I'm not going to have to take the mark. I'm not going to be around because I believe we're going to be gone. I believe the only reason why things have not been blown up right now to bits is because the church is here and the church is alive and the church must make a difference. You say, well, how do we do that? And I... I, while I was gone, I was thinking, because you can get so bogged down in, in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and, and, and all these things that you say, well, so what? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to the average person? So I want to say three things of, of what we can do. Number one, we must keep our perspective. I believe things are getting darker and darker in the world. I just, I believe things are, are because the prince of darkness. Well, listen, when, when, when Satan came to Jesus and offered him the kingdoms, Jesus didn't challenge that. I mean, he's in charge. He's doing things right now because he is a small G, the God of this world. But there is a larger God, and he is the God of all gods. And, and when he talks, Isaiah chapter 46, uh, verses 9 and 10 says, I am God. Uh, there is there's no other. And I, I am God, there's none by me. This is 4,700 years ago now. And he says, remember the former things, I, for I am God, there's no other, and I am God, there's none like me. Verse 10, declaring in the, in the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand, and I will do it at all my pleasure. The reason why he says things in Isaiah the reason why he says things in Ezekiel, the reason why he says things in prophecy is so you'll know he is in control. He's in charge of the affairs of men. What does that mean? That means I don't need to live in fear. I need to walk in faith. So keep my perspective. When, when I was a kid growing up, I remember our whole family going to southern Ohio. We went to some caverns down there. Anybody been in the caverns? Yes. Any caverns? You go down the caverns, and the deeper you go, the colder it gets and the darker it gets. And so, the, you know, the guide, he's got a light, and he takes you. But, but when you get down to the bottom, he turns the light off. And I, I couldn't have been more than eight or nine years old. And I remember when he turned the light off, I went, whoa. 
and I was feeling for my dad's leg, somebody's leg, because I could not see a thing. The darkness was so thick, it was scary, and I was so glad when the guy said, okay, I'm going to turn the light back on. I said, oh, good, oh, good, turn, turn the light back on now, because I feel like we're, we're living in a time when people don't know what to do, and they're walking in the dark. An NBC poll, and NBC is not liberal, by the way, NBC poll says that most Americans believe that Americans are going, that America is going the wrong, wrong way and that we are lost. We are lost. I mean, it, it, it's exactly right. We are lost. But I want you to know, there is somebody who knows what's going on, and he's the God of all gods, and he is working in the world. When we were in, we were in, in uh, Dallas, I went into Starbucks. They have those there. <laughs> I went into Starbucks and there was a guy there. I, I just like talking to people. Um, I, I like people. I think, everybody, I think everybody's interesting and everybody has an interesting story. And so he's in there and he's waiting for his drink. And I said, so, where are you here? I mean, are you from here? No. He said, not yet. I said, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Portland, but I'm leaving. It's crazy in Portland. And I said, I used to live in Portland. Where did you live? And he told me where I told him I, lived. I lived in Beaverton. So we, we talked a little bit and he said, things are so crazy. I've got to get out of there. People feel what he said. People feel that things are so crazy. Things are so dark that I got to do something. And I, but what I'm telling you is keep your perspective. God's in control. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and He knows what's, what's going to happen. And I, let me just say, bottom line this, it ends well. It ends well for us. Things are good, life is good, and, and God is good uh, because He is the light. In John chapter 8, uh, they bring to Him the woman who's taken in adultery, throw Him at His feet, and, and now He's got to decide between mercy and judgment. How's He going to merge the two? And He said, you know the story, he was without uh, uh, sin, cast the first stone, and thump, 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 everybody's gone. And then she looks at him and she says, um, he said, where are your accusers? I don't have any, Lord. He said, I'm not accusing you either. Go and sin no more. Then the next verse, which oftentimes we don't get, he said, I am the light of the world. If any man comes after me, he will not walk in darkness. Listen, Jesus is the light. And keeping our perspective, he is the guy who is the light. He, is, he does not shine light to make people feel bad or condemn people. He reveals things to redeem things. So when you're in church and something comes to mind, that's, and that's not God saying, feel bad about what you've done or, or that thing, that incident or that situation. He's saying, I want to redeem that son or daughter. Bring that to me. I've revealed that so you can walk in freedom and not live like that anymore. Walk in faith, not in fear. Keep our perspective because he is God and he's in charge. Number two, we need to, to walk in power. Keep our perspective and walk in power. We've been uh, fasting for 21 days. If you've not been with us, we, we called for a first of the year fast. And, and so um, today is the last day. I mean, we're done. So you can, you can go from here. I know you were, were really worried about it, but you can leave here and you can go eat because our, our fasting is done. But I, 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 I was reading uh, Luke's gospel, which I'm going to get to here more in a minute. But when he left, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then in verse 4, verse 1, it says, in being filled with the Spirit, uh, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, verse 14. And then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit and then returned in the power of the Spirit. How does that happen? Uh, God wants us to walk in power and, and, and be difference makers. And he wants us to walk in light. Listen, the only light some people you know are going to see is you. There are people who are groping like John in Dallas, Texas. I don't know. I'm just getting out of, I'm just getting out of Portland. It's crazy. People want to get out everywhere. Because it's crazy. 
Now is the time for the church to rise up and be brilliant. The darker things get, the more right, our light shines. If you ever been in a dark room with the caverns, just put a light on, boom. It, it's, it's amazing. Just light. This light feels good, looks good. It is good. It's, I'm glad to see my feet. I'm glad to see my dad. Glad to see my, glad to see anybody. That's what you feel like when you're walking in fear. You don't know where you're going, but the Lord promises to guide us and to help us. You remember when Saul of Tarsus was going to Damascus, what happened was he had a brilliant light. And he fell down and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. The Lord reveals himself to us in power, in powerful ways, and he wants us to walk in power. When he comes back, and this is, this is why I'm bringing this up, we are done, we are done with the fast for 21 days. But we're not done with the power. When Jesus came back, from the fast, and, and, and uh, I, I want you to notice some things that he did. Number one, when he came back is when he went to Nazareth and he, and he spoke. He spoke boldly to his friends and family for the first time, quoting Isaiah chapter 61, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me, but he's called me to preach the gospel to the poor. And, and, he, and, and, and he says all of this, and then he says this, today, this scripture is fulfilled. Now, he, he, ends, he ends the thing, not talking about the day of vengeance, because that's the next part of the verse, but he didn't come to bring vengeance. He came to heal people, to bring light to people, to set captives free, to open blind eyes. So, so he, he comes to do that, and their first reaction, who do you think you are? Because one of the things that happens with believing people is they think they know it all. We think we've got it all. And we think, well, you know, we got this thing wired. We don't need anybody else. And so Jesus, Jesus, the next thing he does, ticks them off so bad that they want to kill him. What did he say? He said, two, two, two illustrations. He said, in Elijah's days, there, were, there was famine in the land, and no one was fed except the widow at Zarephath. Zarephath's not, she's not she is not a Jew. She's a Gentile. And God didn't care for the Jews, but he cared for her. Elijah went and cared for her. They, they're steaming a little bit. Then he goes to the next one. And in those days, there were lepers all over. But no one was healed except Naaman the Syrian. Whoa. If you want to get somebody bad, mad, Tell them that their theology is not right and that God's bigger than your theology and that he loves all people. He loves widows. He loves women. He loves men. He loves people with leprosy. He loves people. And they're going, no way, no way. We're the chosen few. We are God's people, but God's people need to reach out to people who are walking in darkness, which is what, exactly what he's saying here. And they got so mad, they took him to the brow of Nazareth to throw him over the cliff. So he moved on. And then the series of things here that happen, I just want to take you through. Then he goes on and he goes, he goes into a synagogue and a, and a demon says, I know who you are. And he says, shut up and come out of him. He has authority over demons. And then he goes to Peter's mother's mother-in-law's house and she's sick and he rebuked the fever and she's healed. And then all those who were, were sick came and he healed and cast out demons. He, he brought light to them. He brought health to them. He brought power to them. So now we understand kind of what's going on. How do we stand out? We stand out because we keep our perspective. It's a perspective of faith, number one. And number two, that we walk in power. Wherever there's a need, where there's a problem, I'm not the solution, but Jesus is. And God may put you in that situation so you can help show them who is the solution. His name is Jesus. And he may use you to do some things, to talk to some people, to pray with some people, to encourage some people. But you begin to walk in boldness. You begin to walk in power. Then you begin to say, well, wait a second. I don't have, I don't have that kind of power. I mean, I'm not Jesus. I can't do that. How, how do you get that power?
And this led me on a very interesting uh, search this, this uh, past, past two weeks. I never noticed this before. And this, this is, so we're going to keep our perspective. We're going to walk in power. But the way you walk in power is to live in prayer. To live in prayer. As a staff, we made a decision this week. We're going to pray every day. And every staff member is going to take an hour. And uh, so I'm the nine to ten hour. So if you call me, I've got an appointment with Jesus. I won't be available. Uh, Don's the first one at eight o'clock because he's here. And, but that we're doing, we're, we believe the foundation for anything to be strong spiritually has to be the foundation of prayer. And I want to invite you, even though our prayer and fasting time is over, I want to invite you to join us. You can be at home. You can come if you want to. But we're going to pray because prayer is the key for breakthrough. I said prayer is the key for breakthrough. Now let me prove it to you out of the Gospel of Luke. Luke, I had not noticed this before. Luke refers to prayer seven times. Seven times is the number of completeness. But the first time is when he's baptized in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, now when all the people were baptized and it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized while he prayed. What's he doing? He's getting baptized, but he's praying. Father, I thank you for this. And what happens? What happened when he prayed? The heavens opened. The Spirit of God descended like a dove. And the Father spoke. When you begin to pray, you begin to get a revelation of who you are, and God breaks barriers in your life. It happens through prayer. I'd never, I've, I've read this passage a zillion times. I, preach, I usually preach on this out of Matthew's gospel, but I did it out of Luke's gospel, and I found some interesting things in Luke's gospel about how often Jesus prayed. You ready for a little Bible walk? Luke chapter 3 is the first time. The second time is in, in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 18. So he himself, or 16, he himself often withdrew to the wilderness and did what? How often? Just often. He often went to pray. Well, what's he praying about? Well, let's go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, now it came to pass that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. What's he praying for? I'm choosing 12 people to be with me. This is a big significant thing here. I'm going to pray about it. I'm not going to say, you, you, and you, come on with me. He prayed all night about who was going to be his staff, who he was going to mentor, what was going to happen. He didn't just do it. He did it in prayer. Chapter 9. Where are we at? Number 4? Stick with me here. And chapter 9, verse 18. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and said, and he said, who do crowds say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And who, then this is Simon, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. The revelation of, of who Jesus was came when Jesus was praying. And at, that prayer opens the heavens, but it brings revelation. Brings revelation to happen. Same chapter, chapter 9, verse 29. He goes from there, he goes up to, to, I think, probably Mount Hermon, but he goes to the mountain and he prayed. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and, and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah. The transfiguration happens. What's he doing? He's praying. I mean, a lot of stuff happens. What happens when you pray? A lot. The heavens open, identity is open. You begin to choose people who are around you wisely. And, and, and Jesus is transfigured. Uh, two more. Chapter 22. Chapter 22, uh, verse 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you return, uh, uh, strengthen the brethren. Listen, what he said to Peter is true of every one of you. Satan has desired you to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. The book of Hebrews says that he ever lives to make intercession 
for me, that he is praying for me. Lord, help, help that loser get along. Help, help redeem, work things out. He, he is making intercession for me. And Peter, I'm praying for you that when you come back to your senses, that you will become a strength and strengthen the brethren. Last one, number seven. He's still in the garden. Or I mean, he's still in chapter 22. Uh, and, he, and he said, pray you don't enter temptation. When he was withdrawn from them, about a stone's throw, he knelt down to pray. Father, if it's your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then notice this, verse 43. And an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Uh, angels appeared in his life all the way through. Appeared to him uh, after he was, he was uh, fasting 40 days. Appeared to him. If angels were at his birth. Angels were at his baptism. Angels were in the temptation. Angels were here in the garden. Angels are all the way through. Angels are in our lives, by the way. They're just in our lives. They are. And so an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And he being in agony, prayed more earnestly and sweat became like great drops falling down from the ground. And when he arose, he saw the disciples sleeping. Listen, it's time for us to walk in light and be light. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. It's time for us, we don't try to be light, we are light. You have to try to hide your light. Oh, there they are, I don't want to see them, I'm going to just. You need to realize when God brings somebody into your life, it's for a reason. And begin to, you say, well, I'm not sure what to say. Don't worry about what to say. Just love on people. I can tell you this. You can open up a conversation with a stranger in Starbucks or somebody that you know in Walmart, or, or somebody that you love and you, you talk to because they're a relative of yours. But just say, how are you doing? And when you care how they're doing, they care what you have to say. So you begin to engage people because I can tell you this, and maybe you're one of those. Maybe you're here and you're fearful. The day of fear is done. We're a people of faith. We don't need to be afraid. What's going to happen with the economy? I don't know, but Jesus is in charge. What's going to happen when they invade Ukraine? I don't know. It's not my job. The Lord's in charge. What if China invades Taiwan? Well, if they invade Taiwan. They invade Taiwan. I don't, it, it doesn't, I'm not saying it doesn't matter to me, but it's, it's a matter of prayer, not a matter of, 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 of uh, anxiety. Give it, to, Lord, I give this to you. And when you have situations, and believe me now, when you begin to set yourself to pray, you're going to experience some, some, some reaction. When you begin to move in the spirit, you expect other spirits to come at you, to antagonize, to do things. To, to, and so we, we continue to pray, Lord, open your heavens so that anything of the enemy is gone. And all the Lord and all the revelation of who he is and what he's come to do, he is for you. Did you know that? Yes. He is for you. Did you know that? Yes. Let me tell you something else. I believe in these last days that, that he is bringing people to a place of complacency. Uh, what's, I don't know. You need to be around God's people to keep the fire burning in your life. You need to be around God's people to help stir up the fire in other people's lives. You need to exhort, to encourage. Uh, don't just come and sit in a pew and go out and evaluate my message. You're going to do that anyway. But what I'm saying is while you're here, look around. Engage people. If you sense something, and, and just, if you sense something, are you doing okay? Well, I've got... What are your concerns? Pray with, this is the house of prayer. Pray with people. Pray for people. Well, I don't know what to pray. Here's a good prayer. Lord, help them. Lord, help them. I can't help them. Lord, help them. You, only you can help you, but you can do that. You help them. It's a good prayer. Lord, help them. Lord, work in this situation. The Lord wants us to be aware of what's going on around us and what's happening in people around us. And when, we, when, you got, when you got NBC saying people are lost, 
and you got a guy in Starbucks saying, I'm getting out of here because I, 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 he's looking for someplace stable. Did you know we drove, uh, Jimmy and I were in Texas together, we drove by the U-Haul station. You couldn't fit another, you couldn't fit another truck there. I said, they'd probably pay us to drive back to California, one of these things. There's so many people moving to Texas. Do you know why? It's free. We're in California, but I want to tell you something. We're free. We are free. Those who are in Christ are free and free indeed. And I am not going to be in bondage. I'm not going to be in fear. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to trust the Lord. The Lord is the head of your finances. He is the head of your home. Let me just say one more thing because I feel, feel this strongly. There are people that are going through conflict in your home and you've not identified that as a work of darkness in your life. Let this be a revelation to you today. What's going on is not your spouse's fault or your kid's fault. It's the enemy trying to break up your home because the strength of of any society is the home. And that's why the, the home is getting broken down so much. We need to reinforce uh, committed people. You say, well, I just don't love him anymore. I don't care. Be committed. I don't care how you feel. I care what you do. I'm committed. I don't know why Marcia stays with me. You say, well, she's smart. No. <laughs> she's committed. Not she should be committed, but she's committed. We made a decision a long time ago. When I said I do, that means I do. And I have to decide every day that I still do. Even if things are not going well, I choose to love my wife. I choose to remain married. I choose to have a solid family. I choose to stay strong in faith. It's a choice. I choose to forgive. I choose to let things go. If you let things collect up, it's, it's like lint in a, in a dryer. It just gets, uh, uh. don't let it collect. Clear the deck. God reveals things to redeem things, and he's revealing things today because he wants you to walk free, lint-free, clean, and in power. He wants to take all the debris off you so when you walk, you're walking as light. You are the light of the world, and sometimes the only light people are going to see. Amen. All right. Well, I think I'm done. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I don't know where I'm going to go from here. I'll pray about it this week. But there's, there's so many things that I want you to know. Because um, the Bible says, the Bible tells us that there's going to be another, another war. And who's going to be, in fact, there's two more, there's two more, wars at least in the Bible. Um, but in the meantime, we need to stay sharp. We need to keep our, our, our uh, batteries charged. How do I get my batteries charged? Pray and invite the Holy Spirit. You know, this thing, uh, they come in and change it. Sometimes I forget to turn it on. But this is a battery pack. And we have rechargeable batteries. You know what happens? I did a memorial service yesterday, and it, sometimes you forget, and then it'll cut out. So Joey came down and said, I came back with some fresh batteries. When you come to service, you come to get your batteries charged. Do you feel charged up? I want you to feel charged up more than just I want you ready to go. I want you to, in this service, sense the Spirit of God let it make a difference in you so when you leave here, you leave different than you came and you leave charged up and you can't wait to go talk to somebody at Vaughn's or Ralph's or wherever you're going. Since we've been fasting, we're going to go eat. We're going to go eat someplace and do that.